Welcome back to Mastering Menopause. And today I have the pleasure to introduce you to Sean Needham, who um, we, we've been in conversation for, for a while now, but um, Sean is a compounding pharmacist with Moses Lake in Washington. And I'm gonna let you take over the introductions and, and tell, the, tell the listeners what you do. Well, thanks, first of all, for having me on, Kathy. It's really an honor and a, and a privilege. I truly appreciate it. I love sharing my passion of, of hormones with, with people all over the world. So thank you. And thank you for what you do. Um, you know, I think we originally connected on TikTok when I first got on TikTok mm -hmm. a year ago. And, yeah. and you've got a pretty good following on TikTok. And um, your videos started popping up and just, you know, strength training for women in general I think is what you focus on. Um, and of course, we we talk about how important that is. My wife is also a pharmacist and we talk about how important strength training is for everybody, not just for women, um, but it gets yeah. overlooked for women because as you know, I'm preaching to the choir, but oh, I don't want to lift weights and get all bulky and big muscles. And it's it's like, no, that's not what happens. I mean, it's just, right. it's a good- Even term. for men, right? You have to work. Well, yeah, that, that's true. Right, right, exactly. I mean, <laughs> but if you want to be a good- healthy, lean body mass, tone muscles, you lift, man, <laughs> you know, yeah. and that can be many different forms, as you know. Um, but, you know, I mean, resistance training is so, so important. So thank you for, for um, sharing that with other people. Thank you for coming on. I, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, I would, I'm going to pump you for information on HRT. I think that's what my ladies are um, interested in hearing, you know, from, from my menopausal women and just getting the information, first of all, you know, and, and busting those myths about, you know, why, you know, you shouldn't take HRT, right, is, is very common that it's not safe. So I want you to definitely shed some light on this, on, on HRT for women that are going through menopause. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me tell you a little bit of history about us. My wife and I are both pharmacists and we, we own a compound pharmacy in Moses Lake, Washington. In fact, earlier this week, we celebrated 24 years being in business. Congrats. And yeah, and we started out as a full service pharmacy and we never really thought that we would essentially now all we do is hormones and we um, talk patients and doctors all day long about hormones and we ship prescriptions all over the country. And um, we never thought that we would really go that route. We, you know, we would have dreamed that 24 years ago or even thought we were going that route, but it just organically kind of went that route, partly because we realized how much better patients did on hormone replacement therapy. Um, and I mean, the comments we get from people daily about how we change their lives. And, and I'm, I, I'm not, I'm really not trying to brag about this. Um, although it is, it is very good for my ego. I'm not going to lie. That's why we yeah. love it. Um, but we get um, patients daily say how it changed their lives. And um, so that's kind of how we got more and more into it. And it just prevents so many diseases that we, treat in the traditional healthcare system, which um, that's a whole other subject. Um, I know we're not going to, you know, <laughs> it's failing us. Right, right. Gonna, and that's why my wife and I have an alternative. And our goal is to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own health. And, and part of that is, is hormone replacement therapy, we, we believe. And so one of the things that gets a bad rap about hormone replacement therapy is you know, they, they lump every, first of all, they lump hormones into one big group and, and doctors and pharmacists are guilty of this. They would, and, and I even did, did it today when I said hormones, you know, when I say hormones, you know, it, it's, a, that's a, hormones, a very, very broad topic. Mm. And, you know, like for instance, hormone. Vitamin D and cortisol, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Vitamin D is a hormone. And let's even go a little bit different than that. Insulin, insulin's a hormone. So, when, when somebody says, well, hormones cause breast cancer, mm, let's be more specific about that, okay? Yeah. Um, and, and, and they really don't. But, you know, most of the hormonal placement that people are familiar with are for women, and they've been around for years, mostly Premarin in 1947 was kind of the first hormone. Premarin was, um, is called, is, Premarin stands for pregnant mare's urine, literally, it is horse pee, estrogen isolated from horse pee. Um, I, I just say it, stay away from it. There's better alternatives. Um, and, and, and some of that has gotten some bad raps causing uterine cancer and breast cancer. But what we do at our pharmacy and what we talk to patients about is bioidentical hormones. So not necessarily natural or they are, but they aren't and they are, but natural. Remember, 
Natural is primer and natural. Kathy, I'm going to put you in the spot. Is primer and natural? I would say yes. Right. It is. It's yeah. natural to a horse, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, it's natural. So, you know, when somebody says the term, well, I want natural hormones. Okay. Well, that's horse pee. Horse pee is natural. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the specific ones that we talk about are bio identical, bio meaning life identical to what our bodies make up. So, and specifically when I say hormone, I really mean the sex hormones. So like you say, vitamin D is a hormone, cortisol is a hormone. Typically when I talk hormones, I'm talking sex hormones. Mm -hmm. But even when we talk sex hormones, they are so different because they they have totally different actions in the body. Like for instance, we don't typically um, relate women to testosterone. We think, oh, well, testosterone is a male hormone. No, it's not. Women have testosterone also made in their just own. Like men meat. have estrogen. Ex- exactly. And, and believe it or not, women have men have just as much estrogen as women do in their follicular phase um, and when they're not pregnant. But um, that's a whole other topic. So um, we all have kind of the same hormones. It's just in different amounts. And what makes us men is we have more testosterone. Um, so women need testosterone. What does testosterone do? Um, so testosterone is one of the sex hormones. Typically, when we talk sex hormones, it means they're made in the ovaries or and or the testes. So that's when we talk about the sex hormones. Um, and typically, it's estradiol, estrogen, because there's three different estrogens in the body: um, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone. Um, and testosterone. What does testosterone do? So we we know what it, it the benefits that it has for males, and we think of athletes that abuse testosterone. So and that gives us some bad raps too about testosterone. But remember. Most of the athletes that abuse testosterone, they, they, they don't just abuse testosterone. They abuse many other drugs and they use them in super physiological doses. So that's why they have side effects. Okay. That's not what we do. We recommend we replace testosterone or estrogen, progesterone in levels that you should have had when you were like 30 or 40 um, before menopause. And yes, men have menopause too. It's called andropause. And our levels of testosterone just start going down a little bit um, later than women. Women usually start in their 30s, late 30s, early 40s. Their hormones start to fluctuate. Men start a little bit later. And we don't really go into andropause until 40s or 50s, although our testosterone is getting lower before that. So testosterone for, we we know that testosterone is anabolic to muscle mass. It helps to maintain lean body mass. We know that um, because that's why athletes abuse it, right? But also there's a big, it's a big deal maintaining lean body mass. I mean, why Kathy, do you recommend that women strength train? Yeah, right (laughs) to maintain lean body mass and and as you know and this is just physiologically speaking regardless of hormones hormones can help to maintain lean body mass but um it's much easier to build lean body mass when we're younger than when we're older now it is Mm -hmm. never ever and i think you'll attest to this never ever too late to start strength training everybody's on a different level and maybe if you start strength training when you're 60 70 80 you got to start a lot lighter weight, but it's never, ever too late to strength train. And maybe it's only body weight at first, right? Yeah. Um, so, but testosterone helps to maintain lean body mass. What else does it do? What, 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 are, what are we worried about with women a lot? Another reason we strength train. What does, what does um, strength training do to our bones, Kathy? Uh, osteopenia. <laughs> yeah, it helps to decrease osteopenia. Strength training helps to, any weight-bearing exercise, especially resistance training with weight, helps to increase um, bone building. And, and testosterone does the same thing. There is not a better hormone for building um, bone than testosterone. And we, we, we hear about it in school, doctors and pharmacists, they know about the effects of estrogen on bone, but testosterone helps to build bone much better. Estrogen just helps to decrease bone loss. Testosterone helps to build new bone. And we know this because men get osteoporosis also. And do men get osteoporosis because of lack of a lack of estrogen? No, they get it from the lack of testosterone in 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 their older years. So, in fact, I've got an ongoing challenge with um, osteoporosis. I want any doc, and I can challenge them on this podcast. Anybody listen to this podcast? If you are a doctor, scientist, anybody in healthcare or anybody, and you can find a better drug, I don't care what kind of drug. For building bone and testosterone, I'm all ears. There's not one. I guarantee you there is not one. What do we lack when we get osteoporosis or osteopenia? We don't lack. We we lack testosterone, you know? So yeah, yeah, right. So testosterone is great for that. 
Um, also good for libido, more short-term stuff. Good for libido, good for energy. Um, it's a feel-good hormone, helps for depression. How many women do you see? They get in their 40s and they're like, oh, well, I'm depressed. So what do we do in the traditional healthcare system? We give them Prozac. Well, wait a minute. My cycles are irregular and, you know, um, I'm kind of having some hot flashes, something like that, but you're going to give me Prozac. Well, no, what's the common denominator here? Or birth control. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Testosterone. You know, it, it, they might like testosterone. Now, progesterone, estrogen are always good for those things too. But um, let's talk about birth control. So there's kind of a joke in, in our realm of bionicle hormones that in the traditional healthcare system, this is how we take care of women's hormones. If you're less than 40, and, and Kathy, you're going to smile when I say this, because you're going to like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If you're less than 40, birth control pills. If you're over 40, hysterectomy. Right? I mean, yeah. isn't that what we do? It's like, oh, well, you know, you don't need that. You don't need part. it. Take it out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, I'm going to get a little bit cynical here. Um, do we say that to men? Oh, no, yeah, you, don't this rip your, rip your, yeah. <laughs> you don't need your parts you anymore. Need Let's just take them out. Right. I mean, we, we be livid. Right. So um, that's a, kind of a whole other topic, but it's true. And let's talk about compare because sometimes hormone replacement and believe me, even in my, in, in, in my profession, you know, hormone replacement gets linked in to birth control pills, which Birth control pills are hormones, but they're not what we talk about. And they're not like replacing bioidentical hormones, totally different effects in the body. Let me give you a good example of how different birth control pills are for bio than bioidentical hormones. Progesterone. So literally, what does progesterone mean? I'll just break it down in Latin. Pro means to support or for gesterone, gestation, to support gestation. There is literally a drug on the market called Provera that was made to mimic progesterone. And it was made along with Premarin um, later on when they found out Premarin was causing um, uterine cancer. Um, they were trying to mimic progesterone because they knew progesterone would decrease that uterine cancer, but they couldn't patent it. So they came up with Provera. And so progesterone, to, this Provera drug is meant to copy progesterone. I hear it in pharmacy school. It's in my pharmacy textbooks. Um, they'll tell you, well, it's close in structure to progesterone. Okay, sure. Progesterone, progestation, Provera, Depo Provera, we use for birth control. So to think that the hormones are, are the same, right? <laughs> and, and gynecologists get it wrong all the time. And I got to educate them. I'm like, oh, there's like, oh yeah, you know, give them Provera. Okay. Pro Provera is like progesterone. Sure. And I just ask them, I said, okay, I give them that little quiz. How are they used? And they're like, oh. Yeah, they are different. So small molecular changes can make huge implications in the body. Let's face it, testosterone and estradiol, they're close in structure. But if you have enough testosterone, you'll be a man. So don't tell me that, well, they're close in structure, that they're not going to make a big difference. That's why it's so important to have bioidentical hormones, not hormones that are close, but bioidentical. <laughs> Exact copies of what's in our body, testosterone, estradiol, progesterone are the big ones I can think of. DHEA is also important, which it's made somewhat in the adrenal gland or mostly in the adrenal glands, um, somewhat in the ovaries. But um, yeah, so hopefully that helps. Yeah, what are the questions you have, Kathy? So what do we look for when, um, so I know for, in my experience, right, they're going to go for my personal experience, I think a lot of women's were going to get the estrogen, um, progesterone and the DHEA first and not necessarily the testosterone. So this seems to be like, you know, um, so two, two things, right? So how, when, how do we know when it's time to take it? I know we need to get ahead of it, right? We don't want to wait until we bottom out. So what are the signs that we're looking for that you might be a good candidate for hormone replacement therapy? So the first thing I tell women is um, anytime you're having a cycling issue. So if you have, uh, if you start having irregular cycles and they change for whatever reason, they get longer, they get stronger, heavier, they get shorter. That is a sign that your progesterone is decreasing. Okay. So that's the first sign that you should get tested. Now, ultimately you should really have your hormones checked before you have any problems. So if anybody is watching this and you are an adult, um, it does not hurt you to go in and get your hormones checked. 
Um, I recommend estradiol. However, it's hard to get that test. It, it can be necessary, not if you find doctor. the right doctor. And yeah. as you know, that can sometimes be difficult. But if you find the right doctor, they will test hormones on anybody, any age. And because there's women that are, they're teenagers and, and they need their hormones checked because they're having cycling issues, whether they're, they're having migraines that follow their cycles or they're having irregular cycles or, or whatever, um, they get their hormones checked. So, um, and some of the hormones vary a lot depending on your monthly cycle. Progesterone is one of them. So progesterone, when a woman is cycling, I'm not going to say it's a useless test because it's not, but you have to know how to interpret it appropriately. Be because like it's like day 17. All... Yeah, right. And and, uh, and then if you're irregular, it's like, well, when's day 17? Well, I don't know. Yeah. I'm having a period for two months. I don't know when day 17 is. Yeah. So you have to know, you have to go to someone that knows the test to order and how to interpret them. Very important. So, and if you look at um, those tests, like for progesterone, um, even estrogen, They'll, they'll look and, you know, like if you're a 55 year old woman, they'll look and they'll say, well, look, you're in the normal range, but you look at the range and it says normal for a postmenopausal woman. Well, of course you're normal. You don't make any in menopause. That's normal. But yeah. you want to, what was it when you were 35? Optimal. You want optimal. We want optimal. optimal. Optimal versus normal. Right. So I recommend getting them checked early, testosterone, progesterone, estradiol. And, and, and here, here, I think the most important of those getting tested early is testosterone. Here's why. It doesn't vary as much with your cycle like estradiol and progesterone does. So if you get a baseline testosterone, and we see this a lot in women and in men, um, you get a baseline testosterone in your, in your 20s or 30s, and um, then you get into your 40s or 50s, then, you know, the normal level, you can go back and you can tell if you go to the right normal. doctor, you can go back and say, look, I get it that I'm in the normal range for a 50 year old, but look at what my number was when I was 35 and I felt amazing. That's where I want to be. I want to be that one right there. So then you can, you can go back to that because most women will do better. Like the average testosterone for a woman on the top of the range is like a 50. Like I'll just use relative numbers. It's like a 50. Um, but most women, they'll do better. Um, they'll feel better on on levels of 100 to 200, and, and they and they don't have really any side effects. Sometimes they'll get oily skin or acne, but you can back down on the dose on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and you know, it would be nice to know what those women had, you know, in their 20s. What was their testosterone yeah. in their 20s? My guess is Kathy, because we've we've been doing this about 20 some years now, um, and focusing on hormones for about 10. So we don't really have data from 20 years ago yet. To say, okay, well, we told these, we asked these people to get their hormones checked in their 20s and now they're in their 40s. We don't quite have that yet, but yeah. we're going to get there pretty soon. It'll be interesting to see. It's like, well, look, here's my level as a woman when I was 25 years old. And we're seeing some of those women now checking it now. Um, and, and they are, they're in the, you know, higher range. So, um, you know, that's where women usually do better is on a higher range of testosterone. But we get so scared of testosterone because we're like, oh, well, I don't want to grow a beard. I don't want to. <laughs> You know, I, you know, I don't want to get big muscles. I don't want to get a deep voice. No, that's not going to happen. But yeah. do you want this? Do you want, do you, do you want a healthy brain? Testosterone is great for, for um, all kinds of, of central nervous brain issues. Do you want strong bones? Do you want good skin? Do you want a strong heart? Do you want um, good lean body mass? You know, lean, you, you preach all the time about what good lean body mass does. Helps us to burn more calories. Um, helps us to support our frame. Um, mm-hmm. Helps to prevent injuries. Um, Longevity, right? I, I mean, just the, the list goes on. The list goes on. So, and then more specific for women, um, testosterone when applied locally, vaginally, um, helps for vaginal atrophy, vaginal dryness. Um and then it can convert into estro- estradiol, um, or you could use topical estradiol vaginally to help prevent urinary tract infections, to help um, decrease urinary incontinence. How many women in their 60s and 70s are on drugs for urinary incontinence? And what do they lack? They don't lack some drug for urinary incontinence. They lack estrogen. So if a doctor just gave them some topical hormones, those symptoms would go away and they wouldn't have a dry vagina. So then they wouldn't have painful sex. And it's like... It, it, Janet and I want to pull our hair out when we just, you know, when we see some of these people and because sometimes they don't come into us until their seventies, some of us in their eighties and they've had issues for years. And it's like, uh, you know, you feel for them. Could have know. been avoided. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So how, how, what, what is the mechanism for delivery? 
Nice. Oh yeah, so that's a great question. For our, so hormones in general, um, testosterone is not absorbed orally very well if you swallow it. Now in women, it works because you use a higher dose because some of it is absorbed, but in men, it's it doesn't work at all because you would need either a capsule that big and it'd be really expensive. So, mm-hmm. um, but topically, you can do it on the skin. Most hormones are absorbed very well on the skin. Um, and then you can do it um, um, orally for women for testosterone or estrogen or progesterone. Um, and you could also do sublingually. Um, my favorite one for um, testosterone for women kind of because of the things I just talked about is vaginal. And here's why you get great systemic absorption. It's a mucous membrane. It's got great blood flow. Um, so it's absorbed systemically well. And then you get the local effects we talk about. So that's my favorite for testosterone. We also do a lot of sub- sublingual testosterone and some oral testosterone. For progesterone, this is why you need to know to what go- What about with- pellets? Yes, great, aunt, great, great question. Pellets. Pellets are very popular. And, and here's, here's the way they talk about pellets. Like, well, um, pellets, so pellets are, it's a procedure. Use it testosterone, sometimes estradiol, I, I, and sometimes progesterone. I, I, never re- I would never recommend estradiol and progesterone as pellets. Estradiol, if you get estradiol as pellets, you will have breakthrough bleeding. And women do not like that. Um, if you have consistent delivery of estrogen, then you will have breakthrough bleeding. And that's one of the problems with pellets is you can't change the dose. Once they're in, they are in. So if you do have an estradiol pellet and you have breakthrough bleeding, you're going to have that breakthrough bleeding for five to six months. Whereas let's say you had an estrogen cream. If you had estrogen cream, you had breakthrough bleeding. We could change the dose with the cream. It's like, okay, well, you seem to you know, use less, use more, whatever to, to change your dose. Yeah. You can't do that with pellets. So pellets are a quick procedure in the office from the time, if you have a good, um, doctor doing it. I mean, from the time you go in the room to the time you go out, it's like 15 minutes. Um, and the whole point is that it deliver is that it increases compliance and delivers a consistent level of testosterone all day long. Okay, let's talk about that. So, how does our body produce testosterone? Does our product, body produce testosterone like this all day long? No. No, I would say we, it's more of a cortisol response. I don't know. It, you it, tell exactly. me. You're smart. <laughs> You're preaching the choir, right? It follows like cortisol, a diurnal variation. Our testosterone is highest during the day, goes down lower at night, and then that's that cycle again and again, a daily, a diurnal variation, a daily variation. Um, that's how a lot of things are produced in our body. So pellets are more like this. Now, you will get a peak right afterwards. Um, and then here's here's kind of the, with pellets, you're kind of golly by gosh, how long they're going to last. So the first couple of times you have them, it's like, well, come back and we can check your labs one month after, three months after. And then when you start having symptoms, we'll see when you can when you need to come back in. And it's like, well, that's kind of golly by gosh. And by the time you come back in, your levels are really low. So, so that's another problem. And, and here's the other problem. So with pellets, it's a procedure. Some doctors use a stitch, some don't. They just use a, uh, um, oh, a butterfly bandage. Um, with, with women, you can get away with that usually because it's just one pellet. With men, you usually have to use a stitch because it's, it's multiple pellets because it's a higher dose, right? Um, so here's the issue. Um, it requires a scalpel, um, inserted sub Q underneath the skin, a pretty easy procedure if they, if, if they know how to use a scalpel. Um, and then, um, the problem is, is that, okay, you can't, you can't ride your bike or you can't do heavy squats for a week. Well, I'm out and I'm going to guess you're out (laughs) because you do squat. (laughs) I, I have a twin brother and he's a, he's a bodybuilder and he's out. It's like, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Needham, you can't go to the gym this week. Ah, well, okay. I guess I'm not going to do this. I'm not doing this another option. Um, and then, so, uh, and then another, I use my wife as an example because my wife's car is easy. And I've, I've, I've witnessed uh, one of the experts back in Ohio that has done thousands and thousands of these procedures. I saw her do it. Um, and um, on the women that she would do it on, you would see each little scar. So they'd have like 10, 12 scars on each cheek of their butt. I mean, and my wife's scar is really easy. She wouldn't want that. So that's another disadvantage of pellets. Here's, here's what they say about pellets, about why, why do they get results? Yes. Um, here's why some people like them because they will say, well, it increases compliance. And I, this is my first question. 
okay, if you can apply a cream every day and get the same benefit from a cream, you got to do it once a day. It's like, do you brush your teeth every day? Right. Yeah. I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just being, edu- I'm just educating, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, pelts are an option. I, I don't, I don't necessarily like the option, um, you know, for the, for the things that, that I said and progesterone and estradiol, not even maybe in, in, in uh, pellets progesterone, you couldn't get in a high enough dose and um, continuous estradiol causes breakthrough bleeding almost routinely. So. Got it. Questions. What, um... What is, would you cycle it? So th- there's a, there's some debate about that. If you read Suzanne Summer's book, um, they will, she, you know, they will talk about cycling it and that, you know, so what you would do, you know, progesterone, you would cycle, a, you know, a, a half the dose first of the month and twice the dose second part of the month. Estrogen, you would cycle good. like 25 days of the month. And then testosterone, like 30 days of the month. And then you would promote, um, which basically what you would do is you would promote a woman having a period the rest of their life. And, you know, some people argue that- I don't think anybody wants that. (laughs) Well, I mean, that's just it. I mean, some people argue it's like, that's the, uh, that's the, you know, we want to mimic the body as much as possible. Yeah. I I get that. But I will tell you, I've never- That's not the natural cycle. Well, I've never met a woman that really wants that to happen. And and like you say, the natural, you know, when somebody comes and they said, you know, I want to do this naturally. It's like, well, if you want to do this completely naturally, you would just let your body not have hormones. I'm not suggesting that because there's so many benefits of hormones, but that's one of the things we got to, there's a, there's a balance. I mean, you know, how, you know, how um, you, you got to make sure that people are going to get the best benefit from the hormones without having side effects and, and being compliant. So, and you know, if a, if you tell the woman that, well, you're going to cycle for the rest of your life. Like, I, I can't name a woman that would really want to do that. Right. Yeah. I know with my experience with the, with estradiol. So I I'm, uh, tried the patch um, and progesterone, oral progesterone. And that really like, like, cause I was having hot flashes. And so I was like, you know what? I, I was always like, if I need it to take it, then I absolutely will. But I don't necessarily know if I need it yet, but then the hot flashes were just get coming on, coming on hot, I should say. And it was like, oh, it's time. And it like right away, it took care of that. So and then, I, and I, well. yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't love it because I don't like women to suffer, but when they, when they have a complaint of hot flashes and that's their chief complaint, it's like, oh, th- this is a no brainer. I just tell them, it's like, yeah. you know what, your hot flash will be gone in a week. I yeah. mean, and if it's not completely gone. Let us know. We'll have to change the dose, but they will be completely gone in a week. Hot flashes are super easy to treat. And, and I know women, unfortunately, you might have know some women like this, that they, they're so scared of hormones and, and maybe even their doctor's scared of them, hormones. And yeah. so they have, they have hot flashes they've had hot flashes for five years and night sweats and they never, they haven't slept in years and sleep. And, that's the big one. Yeah. Right. And, and here's what I, here's what I just got to say. It's like, and this is a topic for a whole other conversation, but if, if hormones did increase the risk of breast cancer, if they did. So are you telling me that it's healthy to not sleep for five years because you have hot flashes and we know how to treat it. And by the way, anybody that's listening, um, the way to treat hot flashes is like Kathy talked about, you don't take antidepressants for hot flashes. Although gabapentin and Effexor are prescribed regularly for hot flashes. It's like, no, fix the problem. Don't just treat the symptom. And the problem yeah. is lack of estrogen. So give estrogen, estradiol specifically, um, and not an antidepressant for the hot flashes. There's always a cause and effect when you take something, right? And so like treat the treat the root cause you know, right. and not just put right. this bandaid on something like, oh, but this has been shown to help, but wait, this is for something else. Like, so what is, the, what is the cause and effect? Wait, when you introduce something into your body, then you really have to think about that. And that's the conversation that you have with your doctor. What are the side effects? Like what could happen, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think, yeah, could we talk about like the risk for cancer, increasing yeah, cancer? And, and I mean, that is a very, very, it's a hot topic. Uh, right detailed now. topic. Mm-hmm. And, but um, here's what I, I, I like to, and we can get very scientific about it and cite articles and all this, but, but, and, and so let me just go back for the history when we talk about 
I kind of went into it a little bit already. The, the hormones that we're comparing everything to with the side effects, I talked about it, Provera and Premarin. Those are yes. the main hormones on the market that have all the studies that show increased risk of cardiovascular events, um, heart attacks and strokes, and increased risk of breast and uterine cancer. Okay. So- But also, weren't, weren't those studies done on women that weren't necessarily in optimal health to start with? Well, that's one of the problems with studies. I don't know that for instance, for, but I don't know what study you're referencing. Maybe. But the WHI study, for one, the um, the group that had um, an increased risk of cardiovascular events, that group on average was 10 years older than the younger group. And the, and the events weren't that many. They had like one or two more events. So absolute risk was probably like 2% more. Um, relative risk was 50% more. But so, you know, you, you weren't necessarily compared to apples to oranges. First of all, it's Premer and Prevera. That's bottom line. It's not estradiol. It's not progesterone. So this is what uh, this is what I tell people when it comes to breast cancer and hormones, or prostate cancer and testosterone for men, or testosterone and heart attacks for men, because you know testosterone causes heart attacks. So if estradiol and progesterone cause breast cancer, Kathy. What kind of women, what age of women would get breast cancer? Younger women. <laughs> right, but they don't. Yeah. Most women that get breast cancer, even if they, whether they've been on hormones or not, they're they're in their 70s or 60s or 70s. And and they and they may or may not have been on hormones. So so first of all, there's some environmental factors that we can't control. There's genetics we can't we can't control. Or, or that we that we can't necessarily control genetics, but we can change the way we can control the way our genes are expressed. And then, um, you know, so I will tell people whether you're on bioidentical hormones or not, we can't guarantee you're not going to get breast cancer. But I'll give them some some examples like that. It's like, look, things we can't control. We do know this that if we have a strong immune system, it helps to prevent cancer. So if you're having five hot flashes a night at night and you're not sleeping, your body's not recovering that's going to put you at risk for cancer, right? Mm -hmm. If you have low estradiol, low progesterone, low testosterone levels, that's going to put you at risk. You're going to be at risk for many other diseases um, that weaken your immune system, weaken your bones. Um, so, and what would you rather have? Possibly more risk of cancer, which I don't believe there is, or would you rather, you know, break a hip when you're 65 years old and end up the nursing home the next 20 years? So, or dementia, you have dementia because you don't have enough estrogen and testosterone in your brain. So um, the cancer risk, if it was about estradiol and progesterone causing cancer, how come young women don't get cancer? Even this, a more ridiculous- That's a good, that's a good point. <laughs> a more ridiculous comparison. When women are pregnant, their estradiol and progesterone levels Progesterone is like a thousand times more than it is, you know, when they're not pregnant. So it's not about, it's about hormone imbalance. It's not about those hormones causing it. So, um, you know, and, and I, 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 I talked about the same thing with men when it comes to testosterone and causing prostate cancer and heart attacks, like, no, I mean, then why don't 19 year old men get prostate cancer and heart attacks? I mean, right. that's just a rational question. And I don't necessarily... I can't sit here and scientifically tell you the answer. It's just one of the things is, is association is not always proof causation. Well, this person was on hormones, so it caused breast cancer. Well, first of all, what kind of hormones? And, you know, there's a lot of other factors too, you know, yeah. so. I, I'm thinking I'm going to have to have you on for a part two. <laughs> I know <laughs> there's definitely going to be some questions, right? So um, I'm sure some things will come up, but um, just to sum up, right? Um get tested, right? If possible, the earlier, yeah. the better, and then get ahead of it and have the conversation with your doctor. If you don't, if you, if your doctor isn't open to that conversation, because that's pretty common that they won't even order testing, then find somebody who will. And then, right. then we can get on ahead of that's it. That's right. So. Absolutely right. That's, that's a good summary. Thank you very much. So where can, where can we find Sean Needham? I know where to find you, but <laughs> I'm going to, I'll put the links in, but um, yeah, give us, give us some details. You know, the easiest way, honestly, is mlrx.com. That's our, our pharmacy's website. And I always tell people, if you just Google Moses Lake Pharmacy, all kinds of stuff would, would come up or Google my name and all kinds of stuff from social media and um, our website comes up. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on any of my social media sites. Those will pop up and and I and I do my best to to um, answer those. So are you, are you, you're not under Moses Lake on Instagram though. You're Sean Needham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, if you Google Sean Needham, 
it, it, it'll it, those things will come up for sure okay and yeah, it's split. sean with an with a w that's Sean correct. and Needham is N-E-E-D-H-A-M. So congratulations on your 24th year in business. That's 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 amazing. And um, I appreciate you coming on. Always um, very knowledgeable. And uh, I am, I'm, I'm serious about that part too. We'll get that. So we'll get yeah, that yeah, I love it. Please, I'd love to be on again. Yeah, I love sharing this passion. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. And um, we'll talk to you soon.